I'm delighted to be joined today by Andy Braff, head of the UK and European small and mid cap team at Schroders, and Tim Steer, author of The Signs Were There, and formerly a highly rated fund manager at Artemis. Tim, tell us a little bit about your background. I'm an accountant. I qualified back in the day with uh, Ernst & Young and uh, left there uh, fairly quickly after qualifying. I had a great time there. I, I learned a lot, but um, time was right for me to move on. So I, I went to James Capel uh, and then ended up and got recruited and headhunted by Merrill Lynch and ended up by being one of their heads of research at Merrill Lynch for about 10 years. So that was great fun. And then um, I flipped from the sell side to the buy side and... Um, Joined um, uh, Newstar and then uh, Artemis and, and ran about four billion at its peak at, at Newstar. So and quite a bit of that money was um, in hedge funds, and so that meant I had to identify companies that were going to go down as well as going up, uh, and that uh, probably got me going, got my blood going in terms of interest in disastrous companies. So uh, and that's why I wrote the book, really. So Andy, how much did you have to do with Tim's book? Ah, well, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite interesting actually. Um, you know, back in uh, two thousand and three, Tim and I were were the judges uh, for the Sunday Times, and we used to write on a different company each week and sit in judgment, and we used to say whether there were buy, sells, and holds, and we um, sort of started writing together. Now, Tim has written the whole book, but we did have regular brainstorming uh, sessions at the Cafe de Marche. Um, and we had to write everything down before we forgot it after three or four bottles of wine. Uh, and just talking about, you know, examples of companies that, that have gone wrong. But it, it really is all Tim's uh, work. And uh, I just came up with a few of the names to, to look at. Yeah, he certainly helped me. And um, the, the, one, <laughs> one of the great things about Addy Bruff is he's got a view. And actually, he um, he's quite good at um, spotting disasters. He goes through the accounts. And I have to say, he's one of the few people who actually does read an annual report. You would have thought that... A, a fund manager these days would uh, his major job was to go through a you know set of accounts. Well, it seems not, and that's why so many people get caught out. So, but Addy was one of the few people who um, who did go through accounts, and we had something uh, you know something in common there, really. I mean, looking at reporting accounts, it, as Tim says, is quite old old school, old fashioned, and you know, in the world of day trading, which we're seeing on Nasdaq now with you know GameStop and a lot of these other companies. I don't believe that um, those day traders are actually downloading and reading the report and accounts. They're just basing it on momentum and um, casino-like activity. So when you both look at a set of accounts, what's the first thing that you look at? Tim, do you want to well, start off that one first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first, first thing I do, um, I've got a company coming to see me or whatever, I used to do anyway, is to get my two fingers out. I open up the annual report. And I run those two fingers down the balance sheet. And I put one finger on the current year's numbers. And I put one finger uh, on, the, on the historic numbers, the last year's numbers. And I compare. And we know what should happen, basically, in a company that's pretty straightforward. is that we got activity levels up in a certain period, 10%, say. It is entirely reasonable to assume that the balance sheet items move by about 10%. If there's a number that sticks out uh, massively over and above that 10%, then that's worthy of special attention and investigation. So when the company comes and sees you, that is a big question to ask. Why is this number different from what I expected it to be? Uh, and we also got to remember that balance sheets hide the bad news. They're full of bad news. And all the good news is put in the P&L account. So you want to find out about that bad news, and it's usually in the balance sheet. Yeah, I think um, you know, I always, what management are trying to do is they're trying to take the uh, debits uh, out of the uh, p and and put them into the balance sheet and call them assets and take the, uh, if you like, the um, credits out of the balance sheet and put them in the p and and call them profits. So, for a co for example, if a company makes more stock, then the costs associated with that are taken out of the profit and loss account and put in the uh, balance sheet. If they're trying to make sales at the year end, then those debtors, those sales are put in debtors and they're put in the p and and they feed down to profits, even though the money hasn't been collected. So what Tim says is, is absolutely spot on. We're just trying to work out what to, um, management are trying to do. And obviously, if you've got a management team, you've got a large shareholding in the company, they're less likely to participate in this sort of activity because as one of them once said to me, why on earth will I diddle myself? We always remember that um, cash is fact. Every 
every single other number in the balance sheet is a matter of opinion. So um, the one we can rely on, of course, is cash, which maybe lead us on to another question in terms of, I don't know. Just going with the balance sheet at the moment, which are the figures that, other than cash, that you feel more confident with? And which are the figures that you really scrutinise because you always feel it's very easy to hide um, bad information there or hide stuff that's going on there? Well, uh, in the balance sheet, there is a, well, there's loads of places one should look, but I always feel that um, a great place to start is current assets. Current assets is full of interesting numbers that can hide costs that can be taken forward, as Andy has already said, into the next period. So um, to remove them from the P&L account, um, yeah, debtors, um, accrued income, it's very subjective. Accrued income is a subjective balance. Debtors, obviously, is partly dependent on a bad debt provision that is very subjective and prepayments. Uh, that's a way of deferring costs into a next period. Amounts recoverable on contracts. There's loads of stuff. So current assets, and there's lots of other places to look, but current assets is a jolly good place to start. I don't know what you think, Andy. Yeah, no, I think so. Because, you know, in the past when companies have made lots of acquisitions, then what they tend to do is they tend to write down the assets and provide against virtually every eventuality uh, apart from World War Three and then gradually release those provisions over time. So, you know, your point, Tamsin, is, is well made. You know, what numbers do you look at? But it's really like doing a jigsaw puzzle. You know, what Tim said, you know, looking at this year versus last year, that's very much getting the edges, if you like, of the jigsaw in place. And then we've got to go in and we've got to look at what's behind, you know, those individual numbers to get a picture and it could be you know note three which is operating profits after charging various items which might include profit on fixed assets or various one-off costs or reduction in wages which have been capitalized etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's very much getting the framework looking at the balance sheet and the PL, and then filling in the puzzle with the notes to the accounts and what the management are actually saying in their statement about current trading or the year I mean, I've got one of my competitors. All he does is he gets this year's set report and accounts and last year's and goes through line by line and just look at, looks for the different nuances. Now, he's only got about 10 holdings, so he can do that. But it really is. You've got to go through everything to get the, you've got to go through everything to get the picture. Wouldn't you agree, Tim? You know, you're, you're effectively doing the edges of the jigsaw with that, you know, looking down the line. Then you've got to go in and actually look at the numbers to get the whole picture. I really, I really like your analysis of um, the way you look at accounts, <laughs> Andy. When you equate them to the uh, the jigsaw puzzle, and you know, like looking at the, the the balance sheet is getting the outside of jigsaw because in lockdown we've all been doing jigsaw puzzles, haven't we, Tamsin? And um, so you get the outline <laughs> first, and then you start doing the color colored bits in the middle, and eventually, hopefully, you complete it. And you complete your picture, and you understand your company. I always use the uh, instead of the jigsaw analogy, I always use the iceberg principle. The iceberg principle being that you know, ninety percent of a uh, an iceberg is under the water. You can only see ten percent of it as it approaches you if you're if you're in the Titanic or a boat. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, icebergs for me are just like companies' financial statements. If you can see something you don't like, I um, you know, a high level of stock or or a dodgy bit of accrued income, etc., you can be damn certain that below the metaphorical waterline. Of the of, of these you know, financial statements, there's other stuff that you'll never be able to see. So um, I like the jigsaw. I might have to use that in future. Then. Yeah, well, you, why, why change the habit of a lifetime, Tim? Nicking, nicking all my lines, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can use the iceberg principle in some of your presentations. <laughs> right, you're ready. Right, I'll stick. I, anyway. I, I think I'll stick to the jigsaw. But it's quite, you know, it does raise a point, you know, that you know, Tim and I were both uh, in a previous life auditors and you could quite rightly say, well, if you're, what, what are the auditors doing? You know, why, why are these companies not being found out by the auditors? And I think people have got to remember what, what an auditor does. An auditor isn't someone that goes in to find financial fraud. They audit the information that is given to them by the management. You know, when Tim started off as accountants, we were given a brown briefcase and a set of pens to tick numbers. We weren't given a torch and a set of uh, keys to break into filing cabinets to f try and find out what really was going on. So the auditor can only audit the information that they're given and then try and give you a bit of a steer if they can. 
but uh, I think it's a big misunderstanding when you agree, Tim, of what these auditors are actually doing. Yes, I do, and I think I think the auditors, uh, and we were both uh, both an auditor in our in the past, uh, both auditors in the past, Andy, as you know, have got a bad reputation, and I think it's a bit unfair actually. Uh, I think um, they've become you know slight like pariahs like bankers um, following at least following Carillion anyway. But I think you know all the examples in this book right um, <laughs> could have been foreseen by looking at the annual report and accounts and who produced them and signed them off even though they weren't 100 percent perfect that were the auditors and even though some in some occasions they did a bad job even i could see that uh, and other investors should have seen that this these companies were heading for a fall so uh, i think they they get a bad rap and it's um it's unfortunate and probably unjustified a lot in a lot of cases so sometimes it's fair to um, to move expenses to the balance sheets. Take something like capitalisation. When is it appropriate to capitalise and when is it inappropriate to do so? I've not read International Accounting Standard 38 recently, right? Um, <laughs> but that does say that does say that you can capitalise certain costs. Uh, in your balance sheet, you know, if they're if they're if they're recoverable, what what I've always found uh, with companies who capitalise balance sheets, uh, balance sheet capitalise um, costs and expense in this way, it's all about degree. It's all about reasonableness. And if it's if the numbers, you know, pretty inconsequential or small or understandable, then um, that's fine. But so often, well, not so often, but often, um, uh, companies that have capitalised it. Uh, capitalized expenses they are very unreasonable very large and unreasonable and i take the classic example of this one was uh, connells which uh, went bust about 10 years ago but it was a bit of a bit of an interesting one because it was a uh, everyone's favorite you know mid 250 support services company back in the day and pr practically every single major fund manager owned it and yet here was a company that was building an it system it was it was really no more than a painting and decorating company really when it comes down to it or a plumbing company um but here but it was a company it was it was building its new it system and if you worked out um and looked at how much they capitalized in respect to this it system they were employing 200 of their own employees to build this it system and it was no more than a painting and decorating company now i would say to you that was bitter a bit of a, a bit of an overkill in that how could you possibly have 200 people working on an IT system um, for a painting and decorating company? So when it clearly was all kind of made up and it was fiction, it should never be capitalised. So there was an example. I don't know if you could think of Andy, I'm sure you can. Well, it's just, it, your point is, is well made, Tamsin. You know, the trouble is, is creative accounting is a bit like, it's a bit like taking drugs, I suppose. You know, once, once you start thinking, oh, that, yeah, I won't do that again. But then you think, oh, actually, that's really helped my profit and loss account and my LTIP and uh, the shareholders are happy. So maybe I'll just capitalise a bit more. So I think once you start down that route, it's very dangerous. And it's quite interesting now, you know, some companies where you've got uh, management owning big chunks and they've started depreciating freehold property. You know, when Tim and I started, freehold property would never be depreciated because it only ever went up in price. But what, what has the pandemic taught us is actually, well, maybe things don't go up in price. So, you know, accountants should, you know, companies should always err on the side of caution. Yeah, because you don't know what's around the corner. We, I've always personally liked companies which have got, you know, a bit of fat, if for a better word, in their report and accounts. Uh, it could be stock provisions that go up every year or it could be something else. But that allows you some sort of buffer. You know, when we started, Tim, it was, it was all about, you know, you had a general provision just in case for a rainy day. And yes. I think one of the problems, yes. in, one of the problems in my view, is that these all these people now think accounting is an art, is a science, not an art. You know, accounting is an art. No one knows really what the right number is. So you know, let's have a bit of prudence, which seems to have gone out the window. I don't know what you think. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I mean, talking about prudence, I mean, we all know that you know companies need to be will need to be even more prudent than perhaps they were in the past and you know, we're probably saying they weren't prudent at all but they are going to have to start to be prudent because of you know uh, this recent pandemic or this current pandemic uh, and you know cash cash whereas before people were quite happy for companies to take on certain levels of debt um, 
Well, I can bet your bottom dollar that now managing directors and, and directors of companies uh, and investors will be much happier about companies having a buffer, because Danny talked about buffer earlier, buffers of cash as well as provisions on stock and debtors, adequate provisions on stock and debtors and things like that. Cash is terribly important now. And companies that don't have cash in situations like, you know, what we've got with COVID-19 are going to go to the wall. And I think the other thing that, you know, uh, we're talking about companies, another thing investors must really keep an eye on is it tends to, dodgy accounting tends to infect whole sectors. You know, I think when I, you know, (laughs) you just think about support services, you know, Connell was a glamour stock. Circo was a glamour mm. stock. Capital was a glamour stock. Mm. Babcock was a glamour stock. Mighty was a glamour stock. Carillion mm. might have been a glamour stock. I can't remember now. But, you know, it infected the whole sector, <laughs> didn't it, Tim? <laughs> yeah, so it's, we, sectors or companies tend to follow each other. And we had it, as you mentioned, so right, you mentioned in support services, and that's gone on for 10 years. I mean, I can't think of a successful support service company off the top of my head. Uh, and we had it prior to that in, you know, in an IT, IT or yeah. computer software yeah. companies were very aggressive yeah. in the way they recognise revenue. And we got that still to play out with, uh, with autonomy going forward. Who knows what's going to happen to that one? But um, so, you know, it tends to, this, this, this dodgy accounting, this difficult, unfortunate accounting tends to flow um, and, and be uh, prevalent in sectors as well as companies. So it's quite interesting. So moving over to the P&L, um, EBITDA seems to be a favoured metric to report rather than pre-tax profit or even cash flow. When is EBITDA an appropriate metric to use rather than pre-tax profit? Uh, I think it's, it's probably when your P, when your PE is too high, you have to go back up the P and L and find a, find a bigger number that you can then divide the market cap by. So you know, you say somebody got a PE a a P of forty, people go, "Hey, I'm not interested in that." But if they go, "Well, the EV EBIT DAR is only sort of ten times," people go, "Yeah, that sounds quite cheap, then, doesn't it?" So you just got to keep going up the P and L. You got to go, keep going up the P and L until you find a low enough number. That's, that's my view. I think EBITDA is just rubbish. Yeah, but of course, there is a, a much better than a pre-tax profit and EBITDA and EBIT mm-hmm. before every other cost. It, and it's, of course, of course, cash flow. And and um, cash flow per share or cash flow, operating cash flow, is probably a better um, uh, profit number to use than something can be manipulate, being manipulated by subjective items and uh, not affected by cash. So, so cash flow... Per share or operating cash flow is something that I'd be happier to use as a um, as a bit on the fraction, um, a bottom of the uh, to uh, below the market cap to understand how a company's valued. So let's value it on its cash flow and not its subjective profits or you know EBITDA, which is the number uh, before tax, interest, and depreciation, amortization, which are all reasonable numbers to take off a, a profit figure. I'll tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what we do. Townsend, we, we will value your house on an EBITDA basis. And Tim and I, subject to the pandemic, will host a party there every night. OK, and we still value on an EBITDA basis because there'll be no mess. There'll be no depreciation of your furniture or no, no repairs that be needing. And that's, you know, that's what EBITDA is. And is it ever fair to use EBITDA? I mean, is there a justification for using EBITDA in any situation? I think it's. I just think it was something think I, conjured up. I don't you think Tim, it was something conjured up by the private equity world just to uh, talk in well, a different language to try to confuse us. It was conjured up. It was comes out of private equity angel. Well, what I did notice, what I did notice, is that when Andy and I started up back in the day. Uh, and you know he works. Well, he still works at Schroders. I'm, I've had about four jobs <laughs> since, since his time started at Schroders. But 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 we always used to um, we always used to use pre-tax profits. And EBITDA tend to well, back in the day at James Capel, which is a fantastic uh, British stockbroker. But yeah. anyway, um, we used to use you know profits and stuff. And when the Americans took over, when there was Big Bang, and the all the Americans Big Banks took over all those lovely little stockbroking firms that we all you know the names or we've forgotten the names of actually now, it was it suddenly became a bit dark. So maybe as an American, we will become Americanized. I don't know, but I still prefer operating cash flow, which is 
pre-international. So with COVID-19, there's lots of um, sort of adjustments. I mean, the, you've got the furlough scheme, you've got rent holidays, rate holidays. Um, people have got abnormal levels of stock. It's quite difficult to make sense of the financial statements because there's so many um, extraordinary aspects. How easily can we understand a company's accounts at this time? Well, I can tell you just a quick story. I know that um, young auditors, I spoke to a senior partner, a big four company, a big four uh, audit partnership um, a couple of weeks ago. He has actually seen a client for about 10 months. <laughs> and one of the most important things, one of the most important things if you're an audit partner or you're doing an audit is to actually meet people and, and get a flavour of them uh, and to be able to discuss and check things at one part of the management or company say with another and to be an auditor at this moment if time must be extremely difficult i mean you've got a whole new young raft of graduates being taken in in um, in september and august and uh, they've all been working from home they haven't even gone into the office yet so they're doing audits but what i would say is that and he, and he said to me as well he said there's going to be a lot of over provisioning uh, I don't know if you, Addy, you're going to agree with me on this one uh, in for the year yeah. ends December because of COVID. And um, he thinks there's probably going to be uh, a lot of emphasis on companies to show their their cash in a much better light than perhaps it will be or should be. So there will be an overstatement of cash or maybe an understatement of borrowings. Um, those are the things that he would be telling his teams to look at when they go off and do their audits, which they're doing, of course, doing now. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's totally right, actually, because what you know what you've got is um, you, you've got the government schemes, you've got rent deferrals, VAT uh, deferrals, maybe business rates or whatever. So you've got to take the year end cash balance, check that it's you know pretty close to the average balance, not too much window dressing. Number one, and then number two, you've got to look at you know all the liabilities that um, they, they got, these companies are going to have to pay back to start with. Um, on provisioning, it's quite interesting, you know, uh, IFRS 9, for those people struggling to sleep at night, um, effectively tells you if you're a financial company, you've got to recognise a loss up front uh, for a lot of these companies. So they are over-providing uh, in the past. Now, the point is, is are those provisions actually going to be utilised? So one thing we're looking at is how much have you provided and then how has that provision actually been utilised? Because that is when the cash effectively isn't coming back in. And that, again, is another potential liability going forward. So mm -hmm. scrutiny of these numbers has got to be um, absolutely key going forward. And just reading all the results every day, you're picking up what different companies are doing and then trying to apply that across the rest of the, the rest of the market. And if we move on to acquisitions, highly acquisitive companies tend to uh, be quite difficult to understand that, but there are some high quality ones like Halma, and there are some very low quality ones like Conviviality proved to be. How do we uh, judge whether an acquisitive company is is a high quality one that's that's doing it very well, or one that is a disaster and to be avoided? Well, you, you start oh, um, you start on the premise. You start on the premise that actually acquisitive companies are not usually great investments. I mean, that's, that's I think that's given. I don't know if any you agree on that, but um, you know, I read lots of books and. Uh, on not on this subject, but I read lots of books, but not this subject. I have read some books, <laughs> and, um, and 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 it seems to me that there are lots of examples of uh, casualties in terms of companies that have been very acquisitive. So you know, you think about RBS, you think about AB and Amber, you think about Hewlett Packard and Autonomy, you think about AOL uh, and Ty Ward, you think about BMW and the Rover Group. Now, and then you think conviviality back in mid cap space that you know, bought a lot of companies and, you know, Slater and Gordon that bought Quindell. And it's not tribal, very acquisitive, mighty, very acquisitive. They're not great. So, you know, Tamsin, you mentioned um, Halma and, you know, Halma is a good example of, of a company that has done well by acquisitions. But, you know, you've got to get a lot of things right, a lot of things right. And culture uh, and ego doesn't need to be there. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the fits, um, 
the logic behind the acquisition and the integration has got to take place. And so many of these cases, examples where integration didn't take place or the logic wasn't there or they didn't do their due diligence and it was the wrong fit. And of course, you know, in many companies, particularly sports services companies uh, or media companies, the assets are the people move up and down the lift. And, and as soon as they're bought, their earnouts are done, they're off. Uh, and you know that's not great for companies, but uh, generally I tend to avoid uh, companies that acquire other companies. But Halma, you're right, is a great example, uh, and Andy you may be able to think of others of uh, how the acquisition uh, policy has worked well. Okay, I, well, the thing I always look at is you know, what is the most expensive uh, currency a company can issue, and that's equity, because in theory you're going to have to pay a dividend, a rising stream of dividends on it forever. So if if you can actually uh, go to the bank, borrow the money, buy the assets, uh, generate the cash from the the acquisition, pay back the bank, then all the returns then go to uh, the current equity holders. So if I look at what um, Halma, which used to be a, a small cap stock. 40 years of 45 years of putting its dividend up by at least 5% per annum. I don't think has really ever issued maybe once equity for an acquisition. Everything has been done out of cash flow, which, you know, if you're spending your own money, then you tend to get it more right than wrong. When you're using my money or my client's money, then really, do you really care? It just, you know, how do you get paid? Well, if, if I run a bigger company, I'll get paid more. If I'm conviviality, you know, I just want to go and collect a load of assets. It's a bit of fun, isn't it? You know, it's not real money, is it? It's equity. Someone else has given it to me. That's my asset test. And you look at those companies, companies like DCC or Bunzel, both in the FTSE 100, you know, occasional equity issues, but mainly every acquisition for cash. And is it ever appropriate that debt levels rise in order to fund acquisitions for the growth that investors might be looking for? Well, you've got well, to be able to pay it back, think, haven't you? Yeah, that's the key. You've got to be able to pay it back. You know, it's a, it's a bit like, um, you know, if you're an individual buying a bigger and bigger house and just increasing, increasing the mortgage, at some point the bank's going to say, take me on the say, uh, any chance of uh, a repayment of principal? And you go, no, no, the market's on fire. You don't understand. I need more leverage now to maximise the value of my equity. And um, that's what we're looking at. You know, we're looking at companies. Can you repay the, um, the debt you've taken on? Um, and have some sort of buffer. I mean, Tim, when you and I started, people used to say, well, you need interest cover of four times on the basis that interest rates could double or profits could halve. I think also, you know, with this current, with the health concerns that do exist in the world at the moment with pandemics, I think, you know, debt is something that needs to be paid off. If you're going to take it on, you're going to have to pay that off, pay it off very, very quickly. So the returns are going to have to be even more now for acquisitive companies. And um, you know, Andy's right. Debt, debt is right to take on for shareholders rather than issuing equity for all the reasons that Andy's been talking about. But I think the debt now has got to be paid off even at a more rapid rate than it has done in the past because um, you know, cash is king, and we need to conserve it for the uncertainties that clearly exist uh, in this day and age. And Andy, are you surprised the ease at which companies can raise money at the moment with weak balance sheets and the COVID situation around? Um, yeah, I think people people just uh, are just buy into recovery, aren't they? I mean, we saw Weatherspoons the other day. People saying, "Yep, let's." I was oversubscribed so much so that you know Tim Martin sold another fifty million quid's worth of shares. Yeah, people are just buying into recovery. They want to believe that actually we're all going to go down the pub. Well, I want to believe that as well, actually. Um, and we're all going to get back to restaurants. We're all going to be flying and traveling again. And so they, they're thinking, actually, I don't want to miss out here. I better, I better get involved. I mean, for me, I think a lot of these share prices have recovered too fast. I think um, for all the things we've talked about, um, it's, it's not clear to me that what the real level of earnings is going to be for a lot of these stocks going forward. And um, I'm prepared to sit on the sidelines, actually, and uh, and wait. But uh, there's a lot of money around. There's a lot of money around. It makes you wonder where it's all come from. But it's been great for um, COVID-19. It's been bad for just about everything. But the cut recovery from COVID-19 or the anticipated recovery from COVID-19 has been marvellous for the value investors and for those guys who 
we tend to buy cheap stocks and 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 you know and uh, ones that t- tend to not to grow as fast as uh, many of the other growth stocks. So uh, because we see a massive re-rating of the um, of the value shares, the value companies. So it's been great for those people down at the bottom of the uh, the bottom feeders of the stock market. There was a feeling when the raises were first being. Um, done at the beginning of COVID that you had to get in quick if you were a company because funds would dry up. Do you get a sense that there will be fatigue that comes in um, for capital raises or do you think that it'll carry on with the enthusiasm we've seen so far? So so basically before COVID you could issue 10% of your equity on a you know non-preemptive basis i.e. you could issue it to anyone. Um, the deal the fund managers deal did was that actually you could increase that to 20 percent but you couldn't raise the shares at less than a, a 10 percent discount that, that lasted to the end of this year so a lot of companies took advantage of that raising 20 percent and now now you're back into rights issue territory so what we're waiting to see now is those companies who've, who've kind of got over the line and you can read statements from companies yep uh down could be raised x tens of millions of pounds but we've still got these liabilities to pay so i would expect more rights issues going forward which then if they enfranchises all shareholders mr and mrs jones in the street and they can uh, they can then participate if they if they see fit but you know what we're seeing is you know with interest rates virtually nothing people are saying well actually there must be a better opportunity uh, for my money than languishing in a bank account being eaten away by inflation so do you continue to be optimistic for the markets going through this year and into next? Well, we, we sort of, you know, the trouble is there's always, there's always pockets of uh, irrational exuberance in a stock market. It could have been all those companies involved with COVID testing or vaccines, or it could be the whole green economy with hydrogen stocks. Um, but underlying, you know, all the results I've been reading over the last week, um, companies are in better health than uh, I think people would have expected for this time and they have reacted very rapidly and the great thing is, is you know, if you're a management team in a company you tend to sort of manage by committee you get everyone around thinking should we do this should we do that you know what the pandemic has done it's actually forced people to just do it now you know there's no time to think just do it now and we've actually got back into if you like really dynamic management in a lot of companies which most investors thought thought were gone. So, actually, I've been I've been very encouraged the way UK PLC has reacted. Yes, I've I've heard that from um, quite a few of the accountants I've spoken to the last couple of months. In that it, this this pandemic has forced boards to make decisions very very quickly that they might have deferred for another six to nine months, and that was probably quite good news for. Um, for businesses generally because they have procrastinated and this has forced them into making those very difficult decisions about divisions or companies within their portfolio about how they're going to deal with it and there were probably concerns about these activities before COVID-19 struck there are definitely concerns now and they're making those difficult decisions but I do think the world has changed uh, and they're going to be you know themes themes and um, things change from year to year and it, personally, I still think growth is where it's at. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we've got to consider the environment. So ES, ESG aspects are incredibly important. Uh, and I was thinking about you know, a portfolio earlier the other day. And frankly, it has to have an ESG screen on it. This is new. Uh, and every single fund, I don't know if you agree with me, um, Andy, but every fund will, uh, within the next year or so, have to just justify itself on ESG grants. I mean, you're probably closer to it than I am, Andy. What do you say? Um, yeah, no, ESG, ESG is the buzzword, isn't it? It's just uh, yeah. all companies are looking around. Um, but it's going to be interesting how you sort of audit your ESG credentials. You know, you can put your, you can put your numbers in your balance sheet and your P&L and we can come to a view and let people can go and tick an invoice. But when you claim that this is my green... Uh, culture this is the way i do it this is my sustainability you know how far do you go back on the value chain you know if you're auditing a company you can go back to the invoice and it stops there if you're auditing something on a sustainability base do you have to go off to you know 
Burma or the Far East, see where everything's made, what what the impact is on people's lives over there. So, you know, we are just at the foothills of this whole ESG sort of development. And I think that is going to be a where people want to invest because sustainability is forefront of uh, most people's decisions now, and b they want to have uh, a credible sort of uh, basis on which to invest that the sustainability that they're being reported is actually real. Tremendous. Well, thank you both very much indeed for your time. And um, hopefully we can catch up with you sometime in the future. Yeah, look forward to look forward to the what, what's the next book called, Tim? I'm sure the signs were there. What's the next book called? You know the signs were there. Or, oh, <laughs> maybe the signs were there. Well, even three, I don't know. <laughs> thank you both very much indeed. Okay. And to anyone listening, you can catch up on more PI World interviews on piworld.co.uk. Thanks for joining us and stay well.